If you're like me and you're passionate about growing crops, passionate about growing pasture, passionate about healthy animals, then pest and disease management is always on your mind. What if there was a universal theory of pest and disease management? No matter the plant, that just works. And not only that, it allows you to predict the outbreak of disease and do something about it before it occurs. Today's guest is going to talk about some theories that are just now beginning to be understood that might be the theory of everything. <laughs> Pete, how are you going, mate? Excellent. Yourself? Good to M see you again. Oh, mate, fantastic to see you in my vineyard. I'm going to get some good advice. Yep. What do you reckon? Flowering's looking good. Looking it very is, good. isn't it? Yeah. And we've got the right weather at the right time for once. <laughs> Finally. Hey, mate, look, I'm, I'm trying to keep right up on top of pest and disease at the moment. Obviously, flowering is the critical time for fruit production. Correct. You're telling me that there's a new theory that might be the theory of everything as far as pest and disease, and we might only have to look at a couple of things no matter what the crop. Yeah, well, plant scientists around the world being led in the US are looking at a unified theory of everything regarding pest and disease and what actually drives and causes disease within plants and soil. Starting to sound like the Big Bang, mate. <laughs> Look, it's very exciting. Um, being able to go down this path and be more predictive on these things is going to be an absolute game changer moving forward in agriculture. And it will only be beneficial for all of us with a reduction, especially in chemistry, that's required on plants. So a unified theory of all plant disease, having only a couple of things that you have to measure and only three or four places in the plant where they actually get attacked, it sounds too good to be true because there's about a million different chemicals that you can buy out there. Absolutely. What's going on with this theory, mate? Well, chemicals target specific pests and disease. Uh, how plants operate is not to target specific pests and disease through chemistry. Plants are looking for what's called an EH-PH balance. And if you were to put that into layman's terms, we're all electrical beings, plants included. So what's EH and what's PH? So EH is the redox potential or electrons within the plant. And pH is actually just the measurement of the available protons within a plant. So the electrons within a plant mm -hmm. um, are generated by photosynthesis, aren't they? Correct. So uh, it's a measurement of how well the plant's photosynthesizing? Absolutely. And as EH builds within a plant, it actually shuts off the plant's ability to photosynthesize correctly and sends the plant on a spiral where the plant is now more susceptible in certain zones within itself to pest and disease attack based on this electron pressure. And the way that it breaks that cycle is to photosynthesize at a greater rate, which is actually inhibited by this increase in electron pressure within the, the plant, EH potential. So if the EH potential or the electron pressure inside the plant gets out of whack, the plant's solution is photosynthesize Correct. more. But if it's out of whack, it can't photosynthesize. And so it sits there spinning its wheels and then this creates leads an to an environment where pest and disease can attack. Correct, creates an environment within the plant and also within the soil. For, to create the exact environment that certain pests and disease are looking for to attack the plant. The, the difference is, is that from a regenerative perspective, we come across trying to eliminate pests and disease. Pests and disease are actually part of the ecosystem. They're there, we can't eliminate them from this system. What we need to do is to create a plant that can actually attack that pest and disease before it attacks them and create an environment where the plant is suppressing itself. So a healthy plant won't be attacked by pests and disease. It's only unhealthy plants that are attacked by pests and disease. Correct. And in fact, those pests and diseases, they're just organisms that are there to clean up unhealthy plants. Absolutely. They're just trying to live like every other organism within the ecosystem. So if we grow healthier plants, we won't get pests and disease. Correct. That's the unified theory that they're working on currently. And it, all signs seem to be pointing to this EHPH homeostasis or balance, for want of a better word, to allow the plant to do what it's actually trying to do to protect itself. Now we've been able to measure pH for years. Now apparently we can measure EH with a fairly simple cheap meter. Yeah, there's a meter available on the market that, uh, that's available for purchase. I think we were, we were looking at one recently and they're around about sort of five to 600 Australian dollars. Yep. It actually measures both measurements within the soil specifically. So you can okay. start to look at the soil's EH pH balance and start to look at where these pressures are starting to come from from within the soil. So once again, as an agronomist, you look at the soil first and infer plant health from the soil. Correct. Well, the plants themselves are constantly communicating with the soil organisms to do the plant's bidding. In fact, plants produce out of their seed coating when they first emerge, 
microbes, don't they? Absolutely. The, the belief is that when seeds are developed, microbes actually go into a status on that seed. And when the seed is given water and a soil environment to then start to grow, what happens is the plant will start to exudate, or the seed, sorry, will start to exudate out of micropores within that seed, which switches on and wakens these microbes that are then responsible for cracking that seed open and allowing it to germinate. So if we don't go ahead and sterilise our seeds and kill all those microbes, we've got a ready-made defence system in the seed Correct. ready to go. But we have to manage EH and pH to allow it to work. So Pete, I'm really keen to unpack this ECPH balance. Let's unpack it with regards to the three places where we're most likely to get pest and disease attack. And the first one is external, it's the cell wall, isn't it? Yes, well the cell wall is the first defence frontier for the plant. And what the plant's looking for is a pH of around 4.5 to 6 around that cell wall. So around the outside of the cell around wall or the inside? The outside of the cell wall. Okay. And uh, also a mildly oxidative state. What does that mean? So basically getting the EH correct. So not too high EH, mildly oxidative. Mm -hmm. uh, basically what then happens is that certain pests will look to attack in that area, such as Botrytis, Sclerotinia. And when they do, the plant's defense is to actually attract uh, buscular mycorrhizal fungi and certain soil bacillus that are oxidative. So they will create high oxidation and kill the invader, trying to attack the plant. So the plant's in perfect balance, it'll already have an oxidative environment around the cell wall, but if it gets in trouble and that drops a little bit and it gets attacked by a pathogen, it'll actually recruit microbes from the soil and from the air around it Correct. to actually colonise that cell wall and produce more oxygen Correct. to actually kill those microbes. That are invading, because those particular pathogens that are invading require a specific status to attack the plant. Increase that oxidative state, kills them off. Stops so the plant if, being attacked. So if you can measure your EC and pH on the outside of the cell wall, you know not only how well your plant's photosynthesizing, but you know how likely it is that that plant will come under pest and disease attack in the next week or so. Absolutely. And the other challenge is in increasing the soil microbial activity in your soil and getting the right balance with the right species in there. And of course, if you use classic pesticides and you go out with heavy metal sprays and things like that, the first thing you're gonna do is disrupt your soil microbiome so Absolutely. your plant doesn't have its natural line of defense anymore and it's totally reliant on the chemicals that you're using. Totally reliant. You, you, you're literally taking away the plant's ability to defend itself by protecting it with chemistry, overuse of chemistry. So what's the ideal EC pH that we're looking for on the outside of the cell wall? Well, the pH is around 4.5 to 6. Quite and acidic. Quite acidic, yeah, a, a, an acidic environment. And when the actual pathogens can attack is they're looking at an EH of around, around, around about 450. Okay. So, so we want to measure and make sure that that EH is lower than that 450 mark so that that sclerotinia, botrytis and the likes of those type of pathogens are not attacking the plant and don't have the ability to attack the plant. So it's not a case of as low as possible. No. There's a, there's a range that's healthy. In each section within the plant. But below in this new measurement for EH is ideal for stopping disease. Correct. We, we, we now know through this research the, the levels of EH within the plant that will attract pests and disease and viruses to attack at certain zones and regions within that plant. What's well, so I measure my grapes today, it's been quite humid and yes. so on and I'm worried about, say, downy mildew, and I go out and I measure my grapes today and they've got an EH of 600. How can I correct that and bring it down to 450? We need to dry photosynthesis. That's a, a magnificent pro product that we've been using at Greenmate for quite a long time now called Crop BioLife. Yep. Uh, what that does is stimulates the plant and triggers the plant to actually increase the amount of stomata on the leaf yep. and then open the guard cells that, uh, that, that, that respire uh, a lot wider, up to 50% wider, for only a period of two to four weeks. So what we're doing is we're allowing the plant to break that cycle, start to photosynthesize at a greater rate and start to defend itself. So there are natural plant products that you can use if your EH is out of range to actually bring your EH within range so you don't have to use pesticides anymore. Absolutely. We use a combination of soil mate microbials with crop biolife regularly with most of our programs on our farms that we manage. And we do this to allow the plant to have the workforce and the particular species of biology that it requires at any specific time present within the soil structure to ensure that the plant has that pH, EH balance uh, or homeostasis going on with the, internally within itself. So Pete, that's the cell wall. Yeah, correct. There's also an EH, pH requirement in the xylem. These are the tissues that transport water 
from the ground up to the stomata and dry photosynthesis. These are, if you like, the up tubes yep. in a plant. Um, you can also measure the EH and the pH to determine susceptibility to pests in the xylem. We can. The, the EH state in the xylem is extremely electrical and quite volatile okay. and, and, a, and an entry point for things like verticillium wilt. Uh, the pH requirements there, unlike the cell wall looking for 4.5 to 6, is they're looking for a 5 to 6 pH, so a little bit of an adjustment. And the Therefore, plant does that automatically itself. We don't have to do that for it as long as it's healthy. Correct. And it also affects the EH-PH balance within the soil structure. Right. So the xylem in the plant is actually driving the pest and disease susceptibility in the soil around the plant. Correct. There's an interaction to the soil. There is an interaction to the soil. And what we're looking for is the plant calling on specific organisms at specific times when things get out of balance to come and protect it. So the root zone of the plant, particularly that sort of 0.1 millimetre around the root zone, is critically important for plant health. If we go and use heavy pesticides all the time, we're actually going to disrupt the microbes in the soil as well as the microbes on the plant, aren't we? Correct. The, where, where there's a give, there's a get. And what we're looking for uh, when we use agricultural chemicals is to stop, kill or suppress something that's attacking the plant. But now, I, sometimes you have to do that, don't absolutely, you? Absolutely, and we advocate for that. Uh, in, agri in agriculture, uh, utilisation of, of agricultural chemicals is absolutely necessary, very similar to having to use, say, uh, antibiotics if you have a disease with inside yourself as a human being. But what we're looking to do after that is to refeed the soil system, replenish specific microbes that are critical for the way the plant wants to attract them for certain pathogen and disease suppression mechanisms within inside the plant. Yep. And that's on us to ensure that what we're doing when we're doing something that's potentially damaging to the overall system, but a protection mechanism, we're following that up with giving the plant and the actual ecosystem back those organisms that can respond 24 seven when the plant is requiring them because we can't be here 24 seven. Pete, you made a really interesting analogy there just a second ago that I want to go to, and that is the use of antibiotics in humans. Chemicals to suppress disease on plants should be thought of as an antibiotic. If you use them, you're going to create damage to the natural flora, which keeps you healthy. So you've got to take a probiotic and you shouldn't use them for a stubbed toe. You should only use them when the plant's under severe attack. So we should be using them a lot less regularly. Absolutely. Preventative chemistry in the regenerative world doesn't make sense. Preventative is allowing the plant to have this EH-PH balance, provide the plant with the required microbes and organisms within the soil structure, balance the soil out with the required food source within that soil and the actual soil mineralization that's in there for them to call upon and allow your ecosystem to actually function. And that replaces the need for chemistry that's preventative. What we're looking for is chemistry to be used in a curative manner as and when required, but wholly and solely trying to get your plant and soil system functioning the right way. All right, Pete, the next point of attack, the phloem. Now, this is another set of structures inside the plant that drives sugar and minerals around the plant, down to the roots, up to the root chips. The super highway of sugar. And it's all driven by energy from photosynthesis. Correct. This is the other place that pathogens like to attack, and there are very different EH, pH requirements in the phloem, aren't there? There is in this area. It's a very specialised niche area here, where the actual plant is producing pH of around 7.5 to 8.5, and a quite low EH, under yep. 300. Uh, looking for that area and what happens is these particular uh, viruses, pests, they attack, they're only very niche driven, they can only attack when those conditions suit them to attack in that exact environment of higher, P, higher EH and uh, lower pH. And it's really interesting, basically the phloem is a basic pH and yet it's carrying sugar so the plant's working super hard to maintain that environment, isn't it? Super hard, especially considering that in these three different zones within the plant, that they're trying to regulate these three different EH, pH balances to make sure that they're not susceptible for attack. So Pete, it all sounds very complicated when we start talking about EH and pH and all the different levels around the cell wall and the xylem and the phloem. But the plant does a lot of it themselves. What are some things that we can do as growers to help the plant perform as it should to prevent pest and disease to begin with? Well, ultimately, Tim, we're looking to create an environment where the plant is not compatible with what the pathogens and pests are looking for electrically and nutritionally. It's as simple as that. 
And unfortunately what happens in nature when a plant's in status, environmental conditions will create an oxidative state. So they go up and down. It Correct. might be too cold, it might be too wet, yep. it might be too hot, it might, might be, be too dry. might be pests in the, air, in the environment, there might be something going on, there might be pathogens in the soil. So what the plant's looking to do is to create the perfect balance within each of the zones within itself to ensure that they're not creating those niches for those pests, viruses and pathogens to attack it. So what are the best ways that we as a grower <laughs> can provide an environment where it can use those natural tools that are available to it? Well, the first thing is to test. And yep. we now have these tests available where we can look at DNA of the soil, we can explain how the soil's actually functioning, whether you have the right microorganisms in there, exactly what pathogens you're dealing with, the stress adaptability organisms that are within the soil structure. We can look at minerals, we can look at nutrition, we can look at soil structure, we can look at a whole range of things. Then it's a matter of acting on what those tests are telling us. Improve the soil structure, aerate your soil, get the right organisms in there, feed your organisms, don't overfeed your plant, don't put too much chemistry on your plant, don't create an environment within your plant that it is changing its electrical and nutritional status that makes it susceptible and giving it the perfect environment for whatever's trying to attack it to get in and attack it. Someone very wise once said to me, the best fertiliser in the world is a farmer's footsteps. <laughs> observe, 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 seems to be your message. Absolutely, observe, test, retest and continually observe. The amount of places we go to where a farmer hasn't dug a hole in years, it makes my heart hurt. Dig a hole, have a look at what's going on in your soil, check out your soil root structures. Plant things that help your soil. Absolutely. We're looking for diversity. Nature doesn't work in straight lines and it doesn't work in orchards planted with all the same plant. That's not where they want to be. They want to be in an environment where there's diversity, there's different sets of soil microbes, there's a lot of different things going on to allow the plant to function and balance itself out as it sees fit and requires in each of these different zones within itself. And what we do is we get in its way. I've always, I remember one scientist telling me we need to get out of the plant's way. We're constantly doing things to the plant that are inhibiting its ability to function the way it wants to. And I suppose sometimes we do have to intervene. Absolutely. But don't, the big message from you today has been a revelatory one for me. Don't stop with the intervention. That's the point where you start then you've got to do rehabilitation after the intervention. Correct. It's just like if uh, I have a bit of a dodgy knee and if I have my knee surgery and then don't go do the rehab afterwards, I'm never going to walk again properly. What apply we need... a pesticide, apply a probiotic. Absolutely. And then retest to ensure that the environment and the soil conditions and the plant conditions have rebalanced themselves out. Utilise regenerative practices and get advice from people that aren't just peddling products and chemistry. If you know someone who's battling with pest and disease, send them this video. And if you like this kind of story, don't forget, there is an easy free way for you to support the channel that's providing these messages. And that is by hitting that little subscribe button down there. It doesn't cost you anything, so go ahead and do it. And if you want more, there are now channel memberships available as well. And the link for Green Mad Agriculture is in the description if you want to talk about this more. Thanks very much, Pete. Not a problem, Tim. Been, Been a pleasure.